Minds on Muscle community, welcome to the Fitness Pro Mentors interview series. If you want to hear some amazing interviews from amazing fitness professionals all over the world, please join our Fitness Pro Mentors private Facebook group. But today, let's make it rain. Tom? Hello? It's good to see you Brandon, again. How are can you? Can you hear me? I can hear you. Can you hear me? Miraculous. Yes, I can. After lots of tech failure and experimenting, we're finally here and we can hear each other. And you look so good always. You got that beautiful blue shirt on that always makes your eyes pop. Well, it's not really me. It's a CG thing I just keep using over and over. Oh, I've heard holograms are a big thing nowadays. Is that where you're going to be going, you think? No, this is just a two-dimensional version. This is Pixar. It's low budget. You don't have any cracks in the wall where a wind will kind of blow you through? Because that would be a shame. I don't know. All right. Well, if, if it is, we're live. So this will be a very interesting little visual. <laughs> My thin no, I'm okay. You're like one of those airplanes with all the different two-dimensional pieces that go together that make a three-dimensional piece. When you turn, we still get the side profile. Perfect. So right. speaking of unique side profiles and experiences, honestly, I, I was just thinking like before signing on with you, I've been interviewing a few folks from my background and chatting with them. And the funny thing that keeps coming up is everyone when I talk to them, you always come up as this paradigm shifting person that has really influenced a lot of amazingly bright people to change how they think about exercise. And I mean, I just want to say thank you for doing that with me. Honestly, it's such an honor to have met you and have had so many other people meet you and see which direction you've pushed them to think about things differently. It's awesome. Okay. <laughs> thank you. But I have to give you my typical response because you opened the door, but here's the reality of that. Although you appreciate it and I appreciate that you appreciate it. Let's say that 10,000 people have been through various things I've done. Let's say that 200 of them actually kind of sort of get it and appreciate it. So what's the common denominator? Those 200 people in their own lives or me? Because I was in more lives that didn't get it. I spoke to more people that didn't care. I spoke to more people that didn't like me. I spoke to more people that were followers and they were all happy about it for 10 minutes and then they're on to the next thing 10 minutes later. And so really, it, I guess you'd have to say that an educational relationship is a perfect marriage, at least for a while, of someone who has the right questions and stumbles onto potentially the right, I don't like the word teacher, but the right um, learning mentor. I would agree. And actually, on that note, which is kind of like an odd question, you know, the more I study like business and marketing, everyone is trying to get in front of as many people as they can and sell their stuff to as many people as possible, because obviously that's how they get the most money. Right. And so for you, I mean, you've created such an amazingly unique product that it does capture the attention of a lot of people. But like you alluded to, it's like kind of like a small group of people that take the, if you reach 200,000 people, you have a very small amount that actually get the information and then get to employ it in a way that's useful for their practice. Um, is that something that's kind of intentional where you want to put the best information out there and then it kind of harbors a specific group of people? I don't know why you? it's so hard to figure this out, but it took me about 30 years. Um, the world thinks that everything is for everybody. I used to have marketing consultants tell me, well, you've got to figure out how to water this down to make it more understandable for more people. And I was always going, but I can't make smart stuff stupid. It's not for everybody. That's literally like saying to a university, somehow, somehow you guys have got your PhD program. You've got to get it down to where people in kindergarten can get a PhD. That's what you got to do to reach more kindergartners. And it's like, who the fuck wants to talk to kindergartners? Yeah. So really it is that, that marriage of education that we were kind of talking about between what the world calls a student and what the world would call a teacher, when really you and I both know it really is, it, it's a more even relationship than that. It's here's what I learned before, here's where it worked and didn't work. Let's see what you might do with that. I can't tell you for sure. Um, that kind of communicative relationship, you know, if you're old enough, you think about the stupid show Kung Fu with David Carradine and the, okay, grasshopper, grasp the pebble from my hand or whatever that, but it's kind of that relationship. But the big thing is how many people do you know? I'll give you an example. Someone emailed me quite a while back and said, 
I've seen everything you've done. And I went, really? Yeah, I've seen all your videos. Okay, do you have anything else online? And I was like, no, wait a minute, wait a minute. What videos have you seen? Oh, on YouTube. And I was like, what you just did, dude, was number one, I don't get that because every one of those videos that's been put up in the past year says a clip from such and such on exercise professional. It says it in the beginning and it says it at the end. So I don't know what this person was watching, but they shouldn't come to RTS. That's the first <laughs> thing. If they missed all of that, they will miss everything I say. Okay. They have no business coming here. Absolutely. The other problem is this, and this is very, very, very common these days. We are so used to thinking that real education can be acquired on social media that people don't realize that in essence, I put on a two to four minute commercial slash trailer. It would be like going and saying, I've seen a hundred movies this year when really all you did was watch the trailer on TV. You saw two minutes of it and you're claiming to have experienced two hours of work edited down from 100 hours of film edited down from, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, absolutely. So most people are not of the mentality. I'm not saying they won't grow into it. And some people will say, wow, you're arrogant to say that. It's like, look, if you want it to be different, it's up to you, the people out there to change that. I'm just objectively bringing up the fact that people's attention spans, their expectations, their idea of what education is, the idea that books, while you know, I am so into textbooks, I'm so into quotes, I'm so into, by the way, that's another thing that's gone these days is referencing. Everybody on the social media pretends they made up everything. When I was fighting for um, segmental proportions being even understood 30 years ago, you know, before most of these people were in diapers, now they're putting it out there like they invented it and saying it all wrong. They have no idea what they're talking about, but it's really funny. Um, and they don't know where they got it because they heard it through somebody else that didn't reference it and somebody else who didn't reference it. But the problem is that kind of mentality, it is the problem. Those people are the problem. It, it starts with even Western culture where we want the black belt and we want it in a certain amount of time. We don't actually necessarily want to be a badass. Right. We think the badass comes with the belt. Instead of saying, I don't care what color belt I have, but I, you know, the person who could actually annihilate gorillas and stuff that's kind of the person that everybody thinks they are now on that note though like you said something that was important there and i think you know the providence of a lot of the mechanical influence on exercise nowadays uh, that i'm seeing on social media all of it sources back to rts like i see so much if someone's talking about moment arms and profiles like I can see a clear linear path between this person saying this, they were influenced by this person, they worked with this person who was influenced by this person, and then it's Tom. And they're and, getting it wrong. And it is that broken telephone game, exactly, where you're sitting in a circle, and they're like, moment arm is this, and it breaks all the way down. They're, at the end, they're saying fluffy bunnies, because it doesn't, and it breaks down. And somehow, because this person has you know, an attractive physique, they are huge. They have a massive following on social media. That person's getting the attention uh, over someone like yourself, where you spent all this time, you know, quite literally going through all the nitty gritty details to make sure people have all the information they need. And there is this short term exposure of Jack shredded guy or girl says X, Y, and I and Z. don't want the people that like them. First of all, I don't care if anybody likes me or not. I sure don't want followers. Mm. I want people who want to learn. And people think they do, but they don't have the tolerance for the details. They demand in their world a black, white, right, wrong type of exercise. Well, I was going to say thought process, but that's a lack of thought process. Protocolish mindset, right? Where it's like, but tell me the best way. For who? And they go, oh, well, you're just avoiding the question. There's one of these experts out there that says, says things like, if anybody ever says, you know, what's the goal or who for who, when you ask them a question, they don't know what they're talking about. It's like, it's the exact opposite, man, because these people think they have experience. There are people all over the place going, oh, I've been a trainer for 10 years. I'm like, well, then you're in sixth grade. Congratulations. Because I've had clients and patients for over 35 years. Some of them, since I opened my place 33 years ago. What that means is I've watched some people that started at 40 and now they're 70. 
And you think they're the same person they were when I started working with them? So you asked me a question about what this person should do back then. And, and, and so what should Bob do? Well, which Bob? The one today? They're a totally different guy. Same guy, but totally different guy. Orthopedically, neuromuscularly, mentally, ability to focus, what he wants out of the whole thing. It's all changed. So the idea that there's a way to do anything is evidence that someone absolutely, positively, unequivocally has no or incredibly limited experience, and there's no earthly way around that. I will tell anybody that to their face because not a person out there talking has my experiences, and that doesn't make me anything but realize how often I'm wrong. Mm -hmm. Anybody who's talking about how right they are also doesn't have any experience because experience comes from when you are wrong and then trying to figure out ways around that, ways through that, abort, modify, right? That whole idea. So the, the I, it's so funny to me that people are following and liking people on social media who profess to know everything when that's the first sign they don't know anything. And they never reference the more general, anything. The more general the statements, the more full of shit they are. Yeah. There's just literally no way around that. And people hate when I tell the truth because they're like, well, which anatomy book's best? And I'm like, man, I got about 20 of them. And I there's different pictures of different things. This one presents it well. This one's, it, they're very, very, very different. And you want a source? You're a child. Anybody who wants a single source is literally a child. Now they may be 50 years old, but that's a very childish mentality. And I'm feeling very, very, very strong about these statements because they are undermining the professionalism and skill base that people really need. The demographic out there that needs a good exercise professional, that needs that person the most, is someone 40, 50 and over, absolutely should not be worried about this external performance thing where it's like, how many should I do? How much weight should I lift? Let me do this CrossFit thing. Tell me my workout of the day. All of that is unethical. The problem with ethics and the idea that we have malpractice, we don't have malpractice in our industry because we don't have a code of practice. Until you have rules about what to do, you can't break them. And I went to an ethics class one time that we have to do every two years to keep our license. And it was really great. The first thing she said one year was, you know why we have all this, this code of ethics? Because people are too stupid to do it on their own. They're too unethical or too ignorant to recognize when this it could be a breach of someone's privacy, when this could be an unethical practice. And I'm, I'm talking more than, I know you got a lot of stuff to say, to, to ask, but those things are just so epidemic. It's a cancer that's growing and becoming malignant at a rate that is certainly irreversible and unfathomable. And even more so, the people that are involved should stay as far away from me as possible because they are in no way prepared. And all it takes to be prepared, it's not a degree, although that information can help. It's not 15 certifications, although I think that's smart to have because you're not living your life in one religion. You're actually trying to understand what's out there. But the biggest thing is they are not in a mental place to have a quote unquote clean slate, a, 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 an open template. They are not sitting there ready to go, I'm doing this for the sake of my clients. And if you want to come at it from a business point of view, I'm doing it. If a business person said this, I would go along with them. I'm doing it in order to attract and be phenomenal for the best demographic out there. 50 plus disposable income, extra time, gives a crap about long-term goals like, I wanna feel better for the rest of my life. I wanna be more active for the rest of my life. Those people are the best business and we service them the least because we're offering 20 year olds workouts because 20 year olds think that what they do is right for everybody. That 20 year old that's out there, the bulk of trainers will not be able to do that same stuff when they're 50 either. Yeah. Well, it's interesting, right? Because you talk about, you know, thinking science, but speaking client. And I think you said something to marketing there, which I think is great. You know, to some of our students, I'll say market client. 
and then deliver science. Because I think if you market to pull people in and you're using short-term sound buddy things that might not be 100% correct, but you have a chance to have a conversation about it, I think that, that a little bit that's okay. I'm not saying like be terribly inaccurate. The challenge I'm seeing right now that's muddier that you described as tougher is that for like 10 years ago, when I first started, was introduced to you in the mastery program and Peter, there was this relationship between what we were doing and group exercise, cross fitty functional stuff. And it was a clearer separation. Now there's all these people who've taken the mechanical stuff and they're, you know, that idea that we talked about, there's absolutely no such thing as isolation. And we talked about, you can't just have one muscle perform an exercise. And we really explored everything we were assessing magnitude pro profiles, resistance profiles, strength profiles. But now there's people going full circle who are sort of speaking science, muffled science, but just enough science that they confuse people when they're having a conversation. They're doing soundbite science. Soundbite science and the people who are listening don't know any of the right questions to ask to move forward, but because they're doing cool things, unique looking exercises, which creativity, I'll say, yeah, there's some creative stuff out there, but there's no, there's no background. There's no referencing. There's no rationale. And it's worse because now you see an RTS person thinking, and then someone who's doing sort of similar -ish stuff, but not really, it looks similar on the outside, but it's tough. Brandon, we default as an industry, as an industry, we default to choreography. So when you bring up, when you bring up group exercise, you know, um, gosh, my crazy vast experiences from the business side of this, when uh, Bowflex was making more money than God and they bought um, Schwinn Fitness, don't be confused with Schwinn Cycling, they bought Schwinn Fitness because of spinning. And, um, you know, it was a, I thought it was going to be a great opportunity because I was kind of at the time the only thing that Bowflex slashed, you know, they bought Nautilus before this. So it was Nautilus by that time that they had for education, which they saw the value of because they were selling, they knew they were selling mechanics, a device to impart mechanics on the body. And they knew that. And um, so, but they bring on this guy that was in charge of spinning and he was a um, professional football player, former professional football player, president of the company, thought he, cr thought he created spinning when he just manufactured bikes. Um, but I was sitting down with him one time and I go, man, education is the key to this. All of these instructors, all these, blah, blah, blah. he goes, oh, I totally believe in education. And I went, but you're not doing any of it. And he goes, we're at every conference. It's like, you're teaching choreography. You're telling them what to say. You're not telling them how to modify because your instructors don't know. It, it, their way of fixing something is push harder because you're a pussy if you don't, or just get off the bike, which sometimes the good, is a good response, but it's, 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 not modification or regression or any of that kind of stuff that hat that a professional should offer. So one of the things that, yes, it's just choreography. It's here, do this. Oh, no, 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 I customize things. I have two ways of having them do it. Fantastic. You're officially lowest common denominator. You are the scum of the industry. And I'm sorry, it's not even your fault because most trainers have never seen good training. Anybody out there, now I'm going to go back and fix this statement because it's going to be wrong. Anybody out there that thinks that online training is as good as in-person training doesn't understand in-person training. It is that simple. You have got to see someone in three dimensions. You've got to watch every fraction of every rep from head to toe. You've got to, while micro observing, not necessarily micromanage, but triage what you're attempting to manage, realizing that they can only learn and modify so much. And motor learning is the first key. Before someone can challenge something to failure or fatigue, they have to have learned it. And what people are doing, oh, no, I taught them an exercise. No, you, you gave them a couple words, man. They look like hell with what they're doing. Now, I'm going to go back and say this. So, yeah, and I stand by that. Anybody that goes, we get great results with online. I said, well, you're getting, you, you're working with people who just m miraculously can survive the stupid shit you're offering them. Right? But the other thing is that, that, that there are a lot of people who've, I've had the, the pleasure and the honor of providing some mentorship in terms of learning, and they've been staunch, great students and, and um, concerned about their clients and appropriateness and modification. And they've worked with people that they, after, after you know, because of COVID, because of people moving across the country, that they couldn't work with in person anymore, but they had spent enough time with them to know whether this person was a relatively innate motor learner whether they had trouble with this knee, that, osteophytes, whatever. I know big words that most people don't know, and if they do, it'll become a sound bite. They won't know what how that influences something. Osteophyte it, training. Online training can be done marginally 
reasonably appropriate if you already have an incredible skill base and understanding of delivery. And I'm going to forget the word assessment because assessments in the exercise industry are canned slash predetermined worthless things, as opposed to what you and I do, which is investigate and explore someone's abilities, tolerances, all of which is rep by rep, fraction of rep by fraction of rep. And, and, and along the way, one of the things you said too is marketing people, this industry promises results. You'll get results. We guarantee results. Do you understand that is probably the biggest, if not the second biggest lie in our industry? No one can promise results. I cannot promise as a second grade teacher, if I was one, that I can teach everybody to read because someone will walk in with complete inability or more, or more importantly, doesn't give a shit. So that you're going to take everybody and get results. Now, first thing we could realize is results doesn't always mean positive. It doesn't mean sustained. Sometimes the long-term result from a short-term activity that appears to be really productive is a, is, is a long-term chronic problem. Now, I don't, I don't, I used to be the guy that wanted to predict those things and be a fear monger kind of a guy. And I don't do that anymore. I don't know what's going to happen in the long term. And that's the only thing I've ever realized really, really is my crystal ball has been broken since the day I bought it. It doesn't tell me shit. Only what's how the client responds is the only thing that matters. And I cannot possibly predetermine that. Anybody that says they can provide 100% results, how many hours are you working with a person 160 hours a week? Is that what you're doing? Right? I mean, it's ridiculous. So um, what are there, 168 hours in a week, something like that? Is that right? Yeah, I think that's right. So you got three of them, and you're pretty sure the three you've got or two are going to totally counter anything that uh, that person does, sleep, not sleep, eat, not eat, eat too much, eat too little, get a divorce, be <laughs> depressed, need Prozac, have a problem with Ritalin, whatever the case, you're going to overcome all of that with your three hours of counting reps and sets and providing choreography, everybody doing the same thing. Every Come on. That is, again, so childish. Now, the problem is most people repeat those words. We get guaranteed results because they've been indoctrinated into a culture where that's okay. If I took this industry to court in a class action lawsuit, they would bring up tradition and they would bring up expert witnesses from the tra from 30 years of history and they'd go, yes, this is what we say. Yes, this is what we say. But give me a jury because I will common sense my way into getting to see this, indus this industry and the so-called offerings, skills, results, um, exercises offered in order to get results, that these things are so inappropriate because the jury, the vast majority of the jury wouldn't be able to do those things. We would win the class action lawsuit in a second, but the problem is we are perfectly happy with this. Brandon, since I started teaching on a national level and shortly after that international, in 1989, not one thing has changed. If anything, it's gotten exponentially worse. Parentheses, most people out there use the word exponential, but they don't mathematically know what it means. Exponential is a curve like this. Here we are teaching back in the 80s, and the 90s, and all of a sudden social media, and every stupid thing, and even the good things turn stupid because they're taking a, what could be a good thing and doing with everybody. A pretty good hammer, a high quality framing hamper is not how you work on a television. I'm just warning you right now, but that's the way we do exercise. So literally because of social media, and everybody thinks they know, here, everybody should do an exercise like this, not one person says, depending upon the tolerance of your client, depending on where they are right now in terms of their skill with movement, depending on how I would call it, how much they own their body, you might be able to try this with them, but to be, pay close attention because now if they, if you notice this, you might be able to progress that, but if not, blah, blah, that's how you tell somebody maybe how to do something. If you have to generalize, nobody says that. They are insinuating through generalization that what they say is the way everybody should do it. And what that means mathematically is if one person can't do that, one out of the world, then that person is 100% wrong. Because when you say 100% of the people can and one person can't, you are officially wrong. Mathematically, you are 100% wrong. 
I think it gets really tough right now because when you start like for you or myself or someone else, they see you training your hundred year old client, 102, 103, how old is he? Now he's 108 months. 108 months, which is amazing, right? And so when I first thought that I was going to come to Oklahoma and meet you and take the RTS Mastery Program, I had this crazy vision that I was going to walk into Focus on Fitness, and there were going to be spider web bands all over the entire facility from all corners, and you're going to be creating all these crazy results, just because of what I had learned a little bit about RTS, that I was going to be walking into a lab experiment. And when I walked in, you were training someone the very first time that I came into Focus on Fitness. I think it was the Wednesday evening. And the thing that really struck me when I saw you working with a client was that it didn't look different. It didn't look on the outside special. But that was part of what you did that was so amazing is that you were so good at what you were doing. You're so capable that you were able to take very small motions and do very controlled things that was monumental to the individual that was in front of you. And it didn't look anything remarkable on the outside. So the problem is that, I mean, like you're saying, is that if someone walks in the room and they're here for something special and they want to learn something fancy and they see you helping someone do an active assisted hip flexion range going from 90 to 110 degrees and you're holding them and you're going this fast, they're going to think it's nothing crazy. But in reality, and the, and it's game changing. You're right. And the skill level of infield to know exactly how much they're working versus how much they're fatiguing versus how much do I want to help versus wait a minute, I need to stop right now, even though we could probably grind out 10 more, but to what end? Because they are right now struggling with partial paraplegia. They had a stroke there and people go, oh, you're talking about physical therapy. No, they are not physical or physiotherapy clients. They have been kicked out of that. They are no longer making progress over there because in those worlds, you have to make a certain amount of objective progress and range and strength and measurable, externally measurable stuff, or you're done. We have to discontinue treatment. The people I work with often have some of those things, but we continue to make progress across decades. But it has to be within the realm of what they can tolerate slash benefit from and beating the crap out of the body is not something people necessarily benefit from it's something that some people can tolerate well it's all now, i'm not that saying continuum. don't work hard you and i've worked out together and it's fun to kill ourselves but our version of killing ourselves is a very internal monitoring version of listen all the cylinders are firing all the gauges in the in this body as if it was a jet or a, or, a, or, a, or a Formula One car, everything's working right. Because in any of those high pressure, high stress situations, Formula One, jet fighter, whatever, one gauge is off, they got a problem. You can't do Mach 7 with a hydraulic problem. But in our world, we don't know if someone is having trouble because they're not there yet while everything's working well or because things aren't working well. And pushing it doesn't fix it very often. It masks it and all that kind of stuff. So this is a tough thing and it's why my world is a continuum. Absolutely have no trouble going where this person can go based upon them. And my understanding is sometimes for some people less is more. But at the same time when someone is ready for it, appreciates it, and can benefit from it, balls to the wall, man, let's go. Yeah. So it's not a philosophy, except the principles of what does this person need, benefit from, and most importantly, tolerate on this rep, right? 100%, 100%. And it's, yeah, I, I mean, you know that I agree with you, and that's why I'm really excited to be chatting about this. And I think it's remarkable. I think that the proof is in the pudding, really, that training someone for a bodybuilding show who's on performance enhancing drugs and getting them jacked by doing some reverse band deadlifts or something like that, something that looks smart, uh, but someone who's, you know, they're going to change no matter what because they're already in incredible shape. The whole KFC box thing that you said, there's some people you give them a box of KFC and they get in better shape, right? There's a lot of people out there and people are just dispensing exercises on top of them. But the real proof is in the pudding is when you have a hundred year old dude who's been with you for a long time and he's doing marginally better. And if he's not doing better, he's exactly the same he was a few years ago, which is exponentially better than his peers and buddies who are probably not around or probably not in the same capacity, which is fantastic. Um, One of the things, to be honest, I mean, that we absolutely must say, he is not 108 months because of me. Hmm. 
what I do offer him, he's a very motivated person. He started his own business and he's still up till, up till COVID went into work four hours a day because he had old customers that would just want to sit around and shoot the shit with him, right? He's super with it. He's funny. He's quick. And that speaks more to who he is and why he's where he is because of how he is, his attitude, but also he's just committed to being the best he can be. Sitting was never really high on his priority list. Taking it easy was never high on his priority. He was, and he enjoyed what the world would call work was just fun to him. But I but think he you're hitting always, something. Sorry? I think you're hitting something because it takes two, right? It takes two. It takes someone who's proficient and has learned the mechanics for someone who's so sensitive. And then it takes someone who's committed, but there's more committed people than smart people. So committed people who are older go, I got to get stronger. The new and then they, they, the stuff available to them sucks. And they get hurt and then they tell all their friends, don't hire a trainer, you're going to blow a gasket. That's why they often do better in something like Pilates, not because it's the best thing, but because specific instructors are often good. If they're not trying to push range of motion with these arthritic joints, but if they're actually just having the person own their bodies, that's really what Pilates in essence is about, is owning the ranges you currently have. Now it's a, it's a choreography that we could say yay or nay, and we could analyze specific exercises and all that stuff. So I'm speaking very generally, which I hate doing, but as an overall thing, it, it is about owning your body to some degree. And everything boils down to the individual instructor. It's never the trademark that is good or bad, right? So it's how it's imparted slash delivered. But what were we talking about right before that? Um, oh, so think about this. This guy got COVID at two months before his 100th birthday. And you know all that happened to him? He slept a little bit more for two weeks. <laughs> That's perfect. So you do not get to be 100 without an immune system that kicks ass. He's never sick. And when he gets to something that's killing everybody, he's like, I got to take a nap. So how much do I have to do with this? Here's my job. And my job is very similar to what Tim Grover used to say when he trained Michael Jordan. He said, my job is to not hurt him. Michael Jordan is not going to get better necessarily. It's nice when he put on some muscle so he could compete with these, you know, more physical players early in his career and all that kind of stuff. But his whole thing was, I can't be having him do extreme exercises that could in any way. Can you imagine you got the considered the, the most popular and best player for his time and you do a stupid ass lunge? in the wrong position that was never going to help him do anything anyway. But you think that these primal, that a lunge is a primal movement pattern. Well, you, you, that's the dumbest thing I've ever heard. Cavemen lunges. Give me a break. Okay. But the, that's the thing with this hundred year old guy. My job is not to do full range of motion soundbite that nobody knows what it means. Joint range, controllable range, profile based range. What, what do you mean by range? Forced range, exploded range. <clears throat> but my goal is to take what he cur ha currently has and do my very best to have him lose less of it this week because he's going one direction, dude, and it ain't up. So the longer he maintained with me, now he made progress in the beginning because he wasn't doing much and he broke his hip 15 years ago, did the therapy at the hospital, didn't get much better, was totally dissatisfied with where he was. So uh, I, he ended up in my lap. I knew some of his family members and he was just the best guy. And he got, got to where he could get out of a chair by himself, which was not even a possibility. I mean, without arms, get out of a chair and that kind of stuff at a hundred years, uh, 90, whatever he was in 85 or something. But, um, so my goal, while he did make progress, not doing anything that NSCA or the textbooks or the research says you have to do be stronger. You don't have to do, you shouldn't do even. We're going to do a one rep max to figure out how much weight you should use. I don't know. You know what we do with him? What we should do with everybody. Start with learning how to do it. Let's see what doesn't in any way make him sore. Let's see what, let's try to add things slowly so that he actually gets to where this is relatively, he feels better when he leaves. He actually gained a little muscle. If you measure around, he actually, you know, this was when he was 85. But you go from relatively speaking deconditioned but generally active and doing some specific things, even at 90, you might have some increase. But then the rest of the time is this overall, since you're 40 years old, you've really just been deteriorating. 
that he, he's postponed that significantly. He's got great genes. He's got great lifestyle. So my goal was not world-class senior, 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 super senior squat, right? It wasn't, it was, let's help him maintain the lifestyle that he really wants to have. Let's help him keep going to work every day. Let's help him. He had a really hot younger wife. She was only 70. That's a, that's a joke, but it's true. I mean, yeah. you know, you're thinking, <laughs> oh, he's rich and he's got a 20 year old wife. She was 20 years younger. Yeah, 30 years that's younger. Still, that's pretty good. That was still 70. Good. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. So it's, <laughs> he's more of an inspiration to everybody that comes in when he's there than, than I, more of that than what I could ever claim as having helped him. I just didn't screw him up. Maintenance is progression, which is yep. beautiful. Now, if we shift gears slightly, I mean, one of the things with this gentleman, which you've done amazing, is you've provided a, a form of results. And it's funny because you use the word results as a soundbite. Results usually mean something in someone's mind. But for him, he's getting results. He's staying similar. He's able to keep up with his hot wife and do all that. There's one thing when we were the, 10 years ago that you, you created this program that was lateral uh, to some of the coursework. And it was this idea of the missing link. And it wasn't just the results. It was talking about how important the experience is. Now, before talking about that actual course, I mean, you do, if someone has never been to RTS Oklahoma, uh, they really should get out there as soon as they can. Because although the content you're delivering is amazing, the experience of going out for maple bacon, going to Shiki, uh, you know, all that stuff, the entire experience of being in Oklahoma is a part of the learning experience. It's incredible and very powerful, uh, which is lateral to what you teach for personal trainers. It's funny, it doesn't matter how smart you are, how knowledge you are, if you're taught, like you've said this, if you're boring to be around, no one's going to want to be around you. Uh, I was just wondering, I mean, looking, you know, a few years from when you taught that initial program at PHP in Chicago to now, has your worldview or uh, I should say academic view around the Missing Link program changed very much or have you evolved from that thought process? What do you mean? What's what are you thinking when you say academic view? Well, when you did the missing link, and perhaps I should use the wrong words, when you did the missing link, it was really a lot of emphasis on a high quality experience. You have to deliver some results. You got to sell some results because if you don't help people get somewhere, they're not going to stick around. But ultimately, it's part of the experience, the first date, flat, last date thing and all of that. I was wondering of that program of personal trainers in the business lens, I should say, perhaps, um, has there been any revelations for you or has that missing link course evolved into something different? It is more necessary now than ever. And, you know, it was it was an evolution for me just in terms of presentation style, because it became that thing where I brought nothing except some blank pieces of paper, <clears throat> giant poster post-its that we put up. And I let the room dictate where it was going. Now, over time, it became obvious to me. For example, when I put up one of the first questions was originally when you came to Chicago to see it, client walks in, what do you do? The client walks in, what do you do? Well, most people, oh, we do an assessment. Where do you get your assessments? Oh, you get them from ACSM that you're never going to look at again. And they don't mean anything. And they don't tell you how to move, what to do. They don't tell you what to do. But you know what assessments like that are really for? So the trainers don't feel like idiots on the first day. And really, the thing is, what, what are we selling? Remember, that was one of the first things. What is it we really do? What do we offer? And man, the list of stuff. And I got to where I would... Take someone, if the first thing someone says was results, and I would put that somewhere on the list based upon where I wanted it to fall when the list was done. Yeah. So I didn't just put first things first. It was kind of fun. And someone would say, oh, we offer um, motivation. It's like, okay, let's talk about motivation. So it really just opened it. Every answer opened a big can of worms. Like, really? Because there's really only one outcome from motivation, and it's failure. Because motivation is externally offered and more importantly, what are you going to do when you're not motivated? Why would you go do what you're supposed to do, assuming you're not sick and it's inappropriate? Why would you go do what you don't feel like doing emotionally? Mm, commitment. So it led to that whole thing. It was kind of fun. But it, experiences, ultimately, it boiled down. You offer experiences. Now, you may think you're working on results, and we have to talk about results. And I think that's a long-term education thing. A lot of people are like, well, I sit down for four hours or four days or four sessions or whatever, and I do this big interview of my clients, it's like, so you basically subliminally told them they may never work out with you. And, you're, and the people are thinking, oh, but I learned so much. It's like, you know what? 
I always felt like if I didn't show you within the first session a different experience, something you were going to, like if I couldn't find, detect, finagle, ask. So I'm asking stuff, but while we're trying to do things and I'm showing them how I need to learn about them and I'm teaching them when they would go, so what are we going to do? I know mean, it's your first time. I don't have any idea. And they go, oh, I thought you were some big expert. And I said, wait, wait, wait. I can give you the last guy's workout. Do you want his workout? Because you're paying me way more than just last guy's workout. Or do you want yours? And they're like, well, I want mine. It's like, you're not wearing his shoes. You know, he might have a thong on for all we know. You probably have boxers on. What kind of workout do you want, right? Because it's not his. So the thong thing was supposed to be funny. That's but, um, you know, that those ideas were supposed to be stimulating towards education. And that's really where that three rings thing was derived. <clears throat> this idea that there's all this knowledge stuff. And this was something I was going to, I meant to mention earlier. And the knowledge, knowledge is a mess in and of itself. I ended up talking for two days one time about knowledge because we've got sound bites and that's what we think knowledge is now. And then if you went to school, you're thoroughly convinced that you're a piece of paper slash all the books you read and the research, which applies to no one, there's not a single piece of exercise research that applies to any person I see. And sometimes because they're five foot two, 275 pounds with arthritis in their knees. And that's not a physical therapy person, dude, that's just a person. So what do you do? Oh, you put them on the treadmill for 20 minutes. Really? Your understanding of forces on the knees is overwhelming. Holy crap, people. But this, this idea that what is really knowledge? Well, part of knowledge was what we gained from learning about the person. There's only so much book stuff, but the book stuff's important. Because like I talk about when people dive into some of the videos on exerciseprofessional.com, the first thing is we got to have a common language. Because I, you can't be asking me soundbite questions, expecting soundbite answers when I'm actually trying to answer a real question, but I don't even know what you mean because I don't know how you're supporting this bullshit someone just spat out of their mouth. So it's, it's kind of a mess, but getting to where we can speak the same, the questions people ask are very indicative of what they're thinking or not thinking, right? They ask very finite questions. They don't say, how might I work through something? Give me some ideas for how to find an answer. They go, what's the answer? And I'm like, man, you are in the wrong place, or at least you're in the right place with currently the wrong mindset. We got to work on that if you're willing. But um, yeah, so and the next part was kind of an application. It's what do you know? And then what do you do? But what you do also feeds back to what you end up knowing about the client. And what you do shows you how much the textbook does or doesn't apply on a given day to that one client. I don't know and what it's you so think. It's so funny how all these yeah. people, they're talking about, it's all about customization. But then they're all over social media talk, giving general rules for everything. It's like it's the most hypocritical. Nearly, I'm, I'm going to stop there, but I'm just going to make everybody mad with bad words. So anyway, you know what I'm saying. You're about to, you want to bust at the seams and plus you're about to laugh. So... <laughs> I love it. it. Well, no, it just it reminds me, and I was just listening to, I forget his name, but the Wolf of Wall Street guy, and he's got that funny bit where he goes, sell me this pen, right? It's not really about the pen. It's about talking to the individual to find out if the thing you have is a good fit for them. Take, reversing that, I would love it to have to take one of my guys that works here, bring them to Oklahoma, put them in focus on fitness with a person they don't know, and go, okay, train this client. And see what they do because you could almost guess what 99.9% .9 of those people are going to do. They're going to do squats. They're going to just take them through a pre-choreographed program and it's going to work them out. But it's well, the worse same than way. that, they're going to start with an assessment that's inappropriate for the people that come in my place. They're going to do an arms overhead squat, which is complete total evidence that they don't understand what shoulder flexion is. They don't understand the thoracic influence in that. And they sure don't understand squat mechanics. So I could tell you from as the person walked in and sat down and got out of the chair, whether they're going to fail at this or not. The bigger question is, how might we get them if they ever can get to where they could do that stupid assessment? It might for some be, people be a never achievable goal based on their current status and the chronic situation they're in orthopedically or whatever. 
or they just can't motor learn how to control their center of mass anymore. They can't feel where things are. And that's not just this, oh, he's talking about proprioception. No, whoever said that right now did the sound bite thing. <laughs> proprioception is a small, 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 important but small piece of the knowing your body puzzle. So anyway, yeah, I, I wish it would be fun to do those experiments at the, uh, at the peril of our members and clients. But the thing is also, I wish we could do it without the person being on the spot. I wish they didn't know they were walking in, didn't know I was watching them, because it, it screws up the whole thing. Their whole cool thinking they know what they're doing when they're at home, I want to see that too. Which is, you said one time to me a long time ago that if this, if you could do this program as best as possible, it would be like a months long internship where you get someone very comfortable in front of you and you see them for some time and you see them train lots and lots of people. Because it's that first day's last, last day thing. It's if you could have someone, I mean, it's impossible, but if you could have someone in front of you for 30 days with a full-time client roster list and you saw them the Monday of the first day and the Friday of the last day with you, that'd be a very different experience then, yeah, it'd be fun to spread it out longer, but I mean, the, the 30 days is unrealistic, but certainly six months would be way more re unrealistic, but it would be, it would be phenomenal. And the thing I would love are the, are, I, we don't have anybody that's the same across 30 days. Things happen in their lives or they miss, they miss a whole week. Now, do you pick right back up 10 days later as if they haven't? had a deconditioning of their neurological system as if they haven't lost a little motor learning ability and you're going to pick up with the same everything, man, that is, again, malpractice if we had any code of ethics. So, you know, people don't, I don't know. It's just so crazy, but there's so many things. There are things, Brandon, that I do teach. I don't want to say differently, but with much more emphasis and an improved practical understanding. It was it was 80, well, outside of the people I actually saw when I was in school, it was 83 when I started practicing. So we're at, right, we're pretty close to 40 years. Um, and in the beginning, everything was a protocol because I didn't care. I went to work <clears throat> eight hours a day and I just wanted to get to the gym. And I was just doing what the other 20 people I worked with did but then, you know, when you get your own place, you start realizing I can't just offer the same results that everybody else does. And I'm sick and tired of people coming in and me saying, well, I don't know what to do for you because they can't do the first thing the protocol says to do. And I'm like, I, I don't know, you know, I'm, I'm 27 and I'm going, I'm not a dumb guy. Let's figure this out. It was, I remember the specific day where I went, all right, this is, we're going to figure out how to do, and we're going to only do what this person can actually do. That's it. And we're going to do it only to the point where it's easy for them. So they leave, and if anything bad starts to happen, we didn't get too far down the road. As I often say, if something goes wrong, it's a boom, not a you know giant explosion. Um, but it changed everything. And it made me start thinking about, okay, so they can't do this, whatever, back extension, crunch, lateral, they can't do whatever it was supposed to be. How might I achieve the same thing? And that's where I started having to understand things that I already loved. I already loved mechanics. I'd already built equipment for Gold's Gym. I'd already done all this stuff. But I was like, wow, I get to back all this up like a chemist, like figuring out what electrons are going to bind with other electrons here. I'm not just throwing kool-aid into water anymore you know and it really became this awesome puzzle i don't see how people could be bored because every day here's how you're bored you're with, you're working with people you're counting reps and there's these people have no challenges they can do everything you want and it's like man that is the worst life ever for a job it is a factory job not even a management decision it is literally show up put in the rivets go home i would kill myself and smart people would people that need challenges people that have a brain that wants to solve problems as soon as they realize the principles that help them solve problems and that they can work with people that they never could before and a lot of people go i my people do fine with what i do you don't know how many people you worked with that couldn't tolerate what you did back then or for some people today you won't know those people who will never come into a specific environment like a big box gym 
because the culture is already, they know they're gonna be sore the first day, which you and I know is already an injury. Delayed onset muscle soreness is an injury. So we have injured them the first day and they already know without having ever done it that that's what's gonna happen. So we don't know how us being stuck in this inappropriate for the individual world of delivering choreography, we don't know the number of people that absolutely already believe that it's wrong for them. And that's what drives them to, I'm just gonna go walk. And there's benefits to walking. There's all, but at the same time, people that become professionals see a whole new career. They see a whole new set of clients. They see people with an entirely different quote unquote motivation for being there called commitment to their lives, as opposed to, oh, I got to lose 15 pounds for the freaking high school reunion. It's like, get a life, man. Losing weight's all about psychology and food addiction more than anything else. <laughs> so, you know, <clears throat> it's, it's a mess and it, it doesn't have to be, but that now we're kind of back full circle to some degree. This is why it's not everybody. And I don't even want people to come that are just excited from listening to us if there's even one. Because that is again is motivation and that will wane. That will go away. What the people, it's like Jacques, who was on his way out of the industry, neuroscientist on his way out of the industry, because it was just dumb. And he came to RTS and he went, wait a minute, there is something to building an exercise. Why didn't I learn this at ACSM, the gold standard? Why didn't I learn this at NSCA? Why didn't I learn it? Because they don't know it either. Right. Their world is different. They teach what they teach and some of them do it well. We do what we do and it has nothing to do with them. They're not interchangeable. They are not, they are not substitutes for each other. We don't even want the same people. Someone right now is going, man, I kind of see the light. I've been doing that for 15 years. I see the need to up my standards of care and potentially help these other people. It's not so cool, I'm speaking for someone out there, it's not so cool to them anymore to scream at kids running wind sprints. It's not so cool to watch something, I, I can't even believe people are, are, it would be so embarrassing if I had to say the word burpee on a regular basis. I'm just <laughs> telling you, I'd kill myself. I would kill myself. It's like, what is this, Sesame Street? So, um, you know, and, and I think the names of exercises are ridiculous anyway, because they shouldn't, they're not indicative of anything. People think, oh, this name of this exercise indicates how you should do it. No, it just kind of gets you in the ballpark of what this thing might look like. The individuality of how you're going to do it on a given day, not just for a given person, but on a given day with that person, that's a totally different thing. And now there's people out there, listen, when we use the exercise equation and we figure out what the opportunities that an exercise can become, there are people out there so egotistical or so clueless about the vastness of what an exercise can be that they're naming the last five degrees of some exercise on themselves. They're taking, what was this the other day? Pay off press or something. A guy's standing up here and a cable's going like towards you and he's yeah. doing this and they're going, oh, it's great core work. And I'm going, dumbass, you're just lengthening and shortening the moment arm. You're only paying attention to the trunk. You don't see that it's, it's also, you have the same moment arm to your feet, to your knees, to your hips, to your, right? Yeah. And which one's gonna be, we could, this is something that's important also that I don't think I've said enough. We could say, from a mechanical basis, which part of the body has the most torque of resistance against it, i.e. resistance. But we could also say, you think it's a core exercise, but this person has wrist problems. So even though it has the shortest moment arm and the least resistance, it's a wrist exercise right now. Yeah. I couldn't agree more. Couldn't agree more. Tom, it's I'm sorry. It's just facts, man. You don't have to agree. You don't even have to like me. You could shave if you want to. I would still, I would still like you. Well, I'll tell you what, I'm losing it up here. So you got to tell me what's going the secret with the hair because it's not going good. This Are you just pulling off it soon. through like this? Is that what you're doing? I, I think you know, I, as I'm getting stressed with the kid, I'm pulling it more and it's coming down and it's just not good. It's just I need you know more maple it's bacon. It's, it's a sign of intelligence because you're going, I don't know about that. And you're just kind of wearing it out. Well, you're too kind because you don't have any of those spots and you're much smarter than I am. And I, I got to figure out where yours are then. You must have some in the back. No, I use that black spray paint stuff. Oh, I got you. That's good stuff. That's good stuff. Ron Papil. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Tom, I got to say, I got to put a pin in today, but I think there's so much more to unpack here. I'd love to do another one of these with you in a little bit. Um, 
I want to close today by saying one thing, and I know that you'll probably not engage it, but I want to say is in, in case someone hasn't said it enough to you, thank you so much for everything you've done for the exercise industry. I know that there's a small field of spray of people that really get how much work you put in, how much time you put in, how much you've influenced machines and people and taught people how to teach and how much energy you put into making your books, your courses, your online content really robust. And so as much as my accolades may not mean very much, I just want to say to me, it means a lot. And thank you for all the work you put in. It's amazing. Thank you for saying that. I appreciate it. All right, sir. Um, cool. Until we'll have a wonderful time. day until next time. Yeah. I'll have another kid then. So I'll have less hair and it'll be great. <laughs> So we have to start charging for these so you can afford baby food. Well, I need to be start charging for baby food and then whatever that spray is you're using because that'll fix everything up. That's it. Rust-Oleum. All right, man. It was great seeing you. We'll talk to you soon, See man. See you later. Bye-bye.